Amrita is a faculty in the chemistry department. Uh, her work is in on the biochemistry side, but uh, what she is going to talk to us about is uh, her work on millets. And she has been working on millets for a long time since I know her, I think, how many years now? A very long time. A very long time, I think. Uh, it's, it, I think it started as her passion, uh, something that she was curious about. Uh, but then, then later on, she actually uh, worked with farmers, worked with a bunch of organizations regarding the use of millets. And uh, as you all know, this year is declared as the International Year of Millets. As uh, Nija very kindly introduced me, uh, I'm Amrita Hazra. I'm a faculty member in the chemistry departments. Um, I have an affiliation with the biology department uh, because my work spans both chemistry and biology at a scientific level. And uh, some of you may, um, you know, have interacted with me or you know otherwise uh, read about work in happening at ISA Pune. And many of us actually work on the interface of subjects. Uh, at ISER, we are very, very uh, insistent and I am sure it was very apparent from Arnab Mukherjee's talk also that we are not very interested in subjects. We are not very, we don't want to do chemistry and physics and math or what. We want to understand phenomena. We want to understand topics at a bigger level. And uh, when you do that, the natural part of it is that you, you ask questions and you try to solve them with the best of your ability, your training as a scientist. So I am trained as a chemist. I grew up, um, I actually grew up in Pune. I studied chemistry um, uh, sort of in my undergrad and my masters. And then I moved on to something called chemical biology for my PhD. And that's when I started to explore how vitamins, which is something that you know we hear of all the time, right? Vitamins are important for you, X, Y, and Z. Uh, how are these made in nature? And one thing is obvious to all of us for a long time that we can't make most of our vitamins, correct? We are told that you have to eat salads, you have to eat food, you have to eat food that's good with, uh, rich with vitamins, etc. So clearly we are unable to make vitamins, but plants, uh, bacteria, these are capable of making vitamins for you, which is why eating, um, you know, green leafy vegetables, eating um, fermented food often is one way of getting a good source of nutrients and vitamins in your diet. So as I was doing my PhD, what I stumbled upon is how little variety I am eating in my diet. Okay, and I'm going to just sort of walk you through and that was the point when I really started thinking about a diversity in our diets. And I encountered this grain called millets. And uh, I'll tell you a little some of my understanding my findings over the last I would say 11 years or so that I've been thinking about studying millets, I've written grants, I've you know, done some research on millets uh, outside of my capacity of a uh, researcher at ISA Pune. Uh, and that also is another great thing about being a scientist. Uh, you can ask questions in anything. What you learn when you're a scientist is how to ask a question and how to then address that question. You don't learn physics, I don't learn, I never learn or teach chemistry or biology. I learn and teach how to ask questions in chemistry and biology and how to then address those questions. All right. So I hope my talk gives you also a flavor of that uh, overall as we go through. So I've named the talk millets a small grain to confront big challenges. And uh, that's because, you know, it's such a big thing. Like, you know, even the, the poster that had this talk announcement said that uh, it had it in red that UN has declared this year as the International Year of Millets. And hence, this is an important talk. Now, why is it important? Like as a scientist, my first question should be, why is it important? And uh, let's see what the statement is at least. The statement is that the UN General Assembly recently adopted a resolution sponsored by India and supported more than 70 countries declaring 2023 as the International Year of Millets. And what the fine print or the slight details of it says is the resolution is intended to increase public awareness on the health benefits of millets. So millets are perceived to be healthy and they are perceived to be suitable for cultivation under tough conditions marked by climate change. And both of these things, good health and climate change do feature on this list of very well thought out, 17 very well thought out directions for where all of us need to be progressing in the years to come. The UN has put together these 17 sustainable development goals or the UN 
SDGs. And as we go through the talk, we will see how we are checking off many of these as we are learning about minutes. Okay? So, I just wanted to put this up because this is also UN's interest of making this, you know, the International Year of Millets because millets really have a lot of potential. It is a very small grain. Many of us may have seen it. So, what are millets? Let us look at it. Let us just systematically break this down. Okay? So, I am going to tell you what my perspective of this, this, uh, these grains are. So, millets are a grain that is generally classified along with other cereal grains that we eat. And so, there is corn, wheat, jawar, sorghum is jawar, barley, buckwheat, rice, oat, etc. These are various kinds of grains that we eat or that we are supposed to eat. And millet is one of, one category of these uh, grains, okay. Interestingly, proso, this is, uh, you know, a poster I have pulled out from the internet. But there is such little information about millets that we sometimes do not even know that proso is actually a kind of millet. But anyway, that let that be. But this is just basically one of the cereal grains like rice and wheat, okay. Let us start off with that. And these are just photos of the grains and why I have put them out here is I want to show you how different these grains look in real life. So, this is called pro proso millet or china, china is the Indian name. And you can see that the grains of proso millet are larger overall than the grains of barnyard millet and if you zoom in which I cannot do here right now. But the proso millet grains are more round and the barnyard millet grains are more oval shaped like an eye, okay. Um, finger millet is a completely different color and this is just one finger millet I am showing you. There are about a thousand different land races of finger millet or ragi or nachni or uh, you know these are the Indian names which come in all different hues of maroons and oranges and yellows and all sorts of things, okay. So, we are very limited when we are thinking of millets as a handful of grains, all right. Um, scientifically, what are they? How are they different from the rice or wheat that we are most used to consuming as cereals? So, uh, jawar and millet, jawar is sorghum and other millets are C4 tropical type plants like corn. And what this means is there are two major kind of plants that are known C3 and C4 type of plants. And C3 type of plants basically we know that uh, plants take in carbon dioxide and make food for us, correct? This is something we studied in school. When the plant takes in the carbon dioxide, the first sugar or the first carbon molecule it makes is a 3 carbon molecule, 3 carbons are there. And in these C4 plants which are corn and sorghum or jawar and millets, they make a 4 carbon uh, molecule, okay. That is the fundamental difference. Now, in doing so, C4 plants are very efficient at how they make that 4 carbon molecule. What they do is they bring in the carbon dioxide and concentrate it via this uh, organ called, uh, via these cells called mesophyll cells, which then enter into the cycle that allows for this 4 carbon molecule to be made. In contrast to 3 carbon plants where the carbon dioxide is coming in but is not being concentrated, so the pores through which the carbon dioxide has to come in are open for larger amounts of time. And when that happens, yes carbon dioxide comes in but water escapes, right? And so when there is high heat, you are losing more and more water because the pore is open, alright? So C3 plants are worse performing under high temperature conditions and conditions which are go, we are marching towards with regard to climate change, okay. C4 plants in contrast are much more sturdier with regard to how well they respond under high temperature and how they are able to conserve water, how they need less water, etc. So, we have heard the word drought resistant when we think about millets and jawar. People tell you they need very little water and all of that. It is because of this difference, it is a C4 plant, alright. So, that I hope is clear that why millets are better at utilizing water and the fact that they are C4 plants as compared to C3 plants which are typically are uh, rice and wheat are C3 plants, okay. I will go into one more scientific detail before we move on to a little bit more uh, general uh, uh, sort of ideas about millets. So, at a taxonomic level, uh, when you are classifying these 
uh, where do millets lie and why I say this is because we are so used to eating wheat and rice that I just want, I have always wanted to understand this idea. So what constitutes a millet species is somewhat of an arbitrary classification. Okay, so the different millets that we saw, the pro, so the china, the varai, the nachni that we saw on the previous page, they are not the same species of plants, they are different species, but they classify under the same family. Okay, and let me just bear with me while I walk you through that understanding. So the word millet, it's the English, the English word millet, we have various names for millets. We don't, Indians uh, did not start off calling these grains millets. We have various different pet names for it. We have China, Varai, Kodo, these are the names we call it. But a classification was given to all small grained cereals and it derived from the word mill which means a thousand in French. Okay, And uh, they have several interesting characterizations including being found to be cultivated in the same geographical location. All right. So this is the uh, classification. If you, if you have to look at a tree of life or a tree of a classification tree, this is where the millets are all united. Interestingly, this is where rice and wheat and barley are also uniting with uh, at the family level with all the millets. So all the cereals we eat come into the poesy po family and it tells you how little variety we are eating really. If and why I say this is look, look at the, this is how taxonomy is done. So you know you typically classify a plant as from the kingdom planty and then you say it's from a phylum, then it's from a class and it's an order and then it's from a family. So we are at this level of classification and if you look at the variety that you've already lost when you're coming to one classification, it's you know like in the class you'll have pumpkin, grapes, peas, all of these lie at the level of class differences okay at the level of family differences you've already come down to cereal grains and why i am emphasizing on this is because we are eating half of your plate every day is a cereal and what you eat is driving you throughout the day so every day you're filling your body with 50 percent of your body today is filled with one cereal either rice or wheat or a mixture of those two and that to me is a scary thing because we are really narrowing down on the variety of the diversity of things we are eating. You know, you might be eating masale bhat or khichdi or uh, you know white rice, but you are still eating this uh, oriza sativa, and that's the only nutrition, the only nutrients, the only vitamins you are getting are from this one class. Okay, and that's why we need to think about diversity of what we are eating, and hence millets. So, uh, if you just so, what I wanted to show you also is that rice and wheat, which are the most popularly eaten cereals today, lie very close to each other in the classification of taxonomy. And then sorghum and maize lie, or uh, uh, corn lie very close to each other. And then the millets come on another arm of the subfamilies. All right. And you know, you can sort of, even if you didn't look at the taxonomic classification, if you just look at the plants, the jawar plant looks a lot like a corn plant. When you go into the uh, into the field, you'll see jawar and corn. Sometimes I can't tell them apart because they grow these long stalks and then they have a inflorescence on the top, which is the fruit, either the jawar or the corn. So these are very similar and they actually do lie very close to each other in the family. And then rice and wheat, which look like grasses again, lie very close to each other. And then the, the remaining uh, millets lie very close to each other. Okay, so even by looking at a plant, you should be able. You typically have a sense of uh, how they lie on this taxonomic tree. All right, but the important part of showing you this taxonomy is to emphasize that if you want to eat a diverse range of food, you have to think about the scientific basis of that diversity. Okay, and rice and wheat are really not that diverse. So think about it the next time you're. Um, you know, putting that nice uh, naan into your mouth and thinking it's different from the roti I ate in the afternoon. Okay, so why are millets important? And this is the picture that I think is very familiar to us. This is what we perceive as a balanced meal and uh, rightly so because you have this lovely diversity. 
but exactly 50% of your plate is the two grains that I just showed you taxonomically are very close to each other and diversity is going to be very little with the 50% of the fuel that you are putting into your body for your cells to regenerate, for new cells to be formed, for brain cells to be made, etc. So today staples on our plates are rice and wheat and other than the loss of nutrients in our diet, the problems are that because we are ha having this every day, these are only being grown in our fields over and over again, which is leading to loss of soil nutrients because if a plant is growing in the same space over and over again, it's pulling out the same nutrients from the soil over and over again. And that is a huge problem because the soil gets depleted of the same kinds of nutrients over time. Okay, And hence, there's a need for fertilizers and pesticides. And we, you know, rampantly study this in our textbooks that fertilizers are not good for us, pesticides and overuse is not good for the soil, not good for water, but we are causing a lot of that by what we eat, okay. And so this is not a guilt tripping uh, exercise, but this is just for us to think as scientists and as, you know, and when I say scientist, I mean anybody who can think in a scientific manner. It doesn't have to be somebody sitting with a designation of a scientist in an institute. We are all scientists when it comes to being able to logically think through things. And that's all I'm urging us to do via some of these points. So this is just some data that I've pulled out. And uh, this is some data from 2014. And you can see that the world mainly produces corn. A lot of this corn goes in for biofuel and other things today. Wheat and rice. See, the biggest bars are corn, wheat, and rice. And then there are little, little bits of jawar, very little of millet, barley, etc. Even today in 2020 is the latest report I found which had a similar looking graph and in like you know six to seven years nothing has really changed. Corn is the highest produced, wheat and rice and then millets don't even feature on this graph because for whatever reason the scientists didn't include it. But it just shows you that there's very little of millets being produced in the world. Even though it's the international year of millet and all of that, it's important that we know that there's very little of this stuff available out there. Okay. The why is it? Yeah, yeah. It's primarily because it's a very difficult grain to process and use in an industrial manner. And I'll get to that in a bit why that is the case. But you you're looking for industrial efficiency when it comes to agriculture, right? You're looking to make the best producing plants, etc. And then you're looking to make the the grains that store the best that have the longest lifetime. Like, you know, you buy a packet of maida, paat saal kuch nahi hoga maida ko. Aata, you buy, ek saal kuch nahi hoga. You buy millet, you buy ground millet, do mahine mein you get that uh, sort of oily smell that comes, right? So that is where it, there's a pushback from that level almost, that if you want to make, if you want to overproduce millets, you will have to have a very different way of approaching the way you're consuming food and industrialization overall. So I, 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 my, my uh, sort of, uh, my visualization of this is that way because it, it comes from um, millets were around in the 15, in, in the 1950s and 60s and then they faded over time, right? And it's mainly faded because these are industrially very, very viable grains, right? <clears throat> okay, so we are the largest producer of millets in the world even though the total amount of millets produced in the world at the most is that. Even then, having said that, we are proudly the largest producer of millets in the world. We produce 38% of the world's millets. And I want to point out one interesting thing here. What is the state that is producing the highest amount of bajra in India? Rajasthan. What do we think when we think Rajasthan? Hot, desert, no water, right? And they are the largest producer of bajra in India today. So that tells you the way in which, how resilient these grains can be and the fact that when nothing grows, you grow some millets. So we haven't also really tuned for efficiency and in industrial growth for millets. We grow it when nothing else grows most of the time. If you grow it in fertile soil, millets will grow very well. Uh, but then the next part which is processing it, etc. needs to be worked on to make it viable for our society as we live today. So that's one of the interesting things. But this is something that really strike, strikes you, right? That Rajasthan, which you really associate with not growing much, is the highest producer of bajra in India today. And this is true for 2023 also, I, that I checked before I uh, came for the talk. So um, this is the distribution of uh, millets. And 
this is the only these are the only parts of the world where millets are grown today okay and this is you can see that there are you know india of course features a lot some places in africa in the middle right around the equator there are a few places that are growing millets so anywhere where things don't grow millets are being grown and that tells you the potential of millets in the face of climate change and increasing temperatures okay and so this is in some sense uh, i would even though it's it, it looks a little sad that i wish there were more millets growing because if i put if i had put for comparison a wheat graph or a rice graph wheat would have been all over actually rice not as much but wheat grows all over the world okay but it tells you that there's a lot of hope for these grains in the onset of climate change and where we are going with regard to increasing temperatures and things like that um india also of course has the highest market share uh, globally of this grain and that's why it makes a lot of sense that we become more aware of this grain and we are the right people to sort of you know really take this forward not only for the world's sake but for our own sake okay then the nutrition angle which is really really related to us as uh, each individual so uh, having said that millets in india make up only 5 to 8% of all grains and pulses produced and that is exactly why what you were asking that you know why is this less even in india and that is just an, a bunch of interesting reasons that i will allude to in a little bit but what you can see is rice is our highest production wheat then pulses and then jowar and bajra come after and the little millets don't even record the other ones that i showed you the barnyard millet and the uh, ragi and all don't even record in this uh, in in a, in a, in a chart like this all right so why are millets difficult to store consequently why are millets good or more nutritious for us and i actually say this quite confidently that they are more nutritious i don't claim at all that they are going to solve your cancer and they are going to solve diabetes i don't know that is not many of these claims may or may not be true but what is true i can tell you at least some ideas of the the facts that lie and then you have to draw your own conclusions as scientists okay so this is a kernel of wheat and this part which is this inner layer it's called the endosperm okay now can you tell me that when you eat maida which parts of this wheat do you eat and i'll show you the parts that are there there's something called the bran which is the outer layer of the wheat which is the brown part of the wheat the germ which is where the embryo is so that you know when you plant the seed it will make a new plant it's a small part of the grain and then there's the endosperm which is storing the energy for the new plant to be able to put forth another new plant okay the seed is storing this nutrient to be able to encourage this embryo to grow into a new plant so when you eat maida which has the highest shelf life do you know which of this you are eating and why you are eating the endosperm and why is that it has only starch right and starch is like sugar if you take white refined sugar leave it for 100 years unless there are ants or something it's going nowhere right it's going to be pretty good it will probably become like slightly yellow at the end of those 100 years maida is sort of like that it's starchy and hence it has a very high shelf life but what you've missed out is all these other nutrients that you're getting going to get from the bran which is full of oils and which is why atta which you um, you know if you grind your own atta from your own wheat you'll see that it has a shorter shelf life than even industrially bought atta because you're just grinding the whole thing together and all these oils etc are mixing with the starch and all and the oils become rancid over time rancidity is the oxidation of oils and they make this weird smell right we've had uh, shengdana we've had peanuts which will have this odd taste once in a while right and that's because the oil in the peanut becomes oxidized and it gives it this rancid flavor all right so these are the bran layer oils which are going to be mixed all over when you're making a whole grain atta and it's going to make over time start getting oxidized and hence wheat will typically have a shorter if you go and just look all of you should go and look at the packet if you're buying wheat uh, look at the packet and look at the expiry date wheat is usually 3 to 4 months they'll say okay uh, atta ka shelf life and maida ka will be 2 years comfortably or maybe 1 year nowadays just because they want they sometimes this is sale uh, thing that they want to also pull up interestingly in millets see how the bran 
the germ and the protein layers are all very tightly integrated. So how in wheat you can even you even have the industrial capacity to pull out the bran layer to remove the bran layer and isolate the endosperm um, you can't do that for a millet and hence you can never get only the starch of millet that is the magic of this grain if you are eating millet you are necessarily eating a whole grain there is no way that you're, if you are ever eating any millet it is a whole grain whatever atta you are eating whole millet you are eating it's always the whole grain because everything the starch you can see the starch granules which are the pentagonal objects in here the protein bodies which are the, uh, the 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 blue dots and the starchy endosperm which is the space inside all of that is mixed very well together so it's not possible to separate out the starchy endosperm like you would do for wheat okay and so millet by definition is always whole grain very difficult to get rid of the other parts you can get rid of the bran layer to some extent uh, by polishing it and all and that's what uh, you know sometimes we we'll eat this um, for upvas for uh, for fasts in maharashtra they eat this grain called samai this white grain you get and the whiteness only is there because we like we as consumers like white things but what you've done there is you've just removed all that bran that brown color outside you've just removed it by just scaling it off and you're coming to the white place but even then you're eating a mix of starch and proteins okay but ideally don't ever buy a white millet it's generally you know removing nutrients when you're buying a white millet always try to buy, buy a brown or a you know yellowish colored millet it's usually a whole grain all right but that's the reason primarily why you can never make a starchy product out of millet also millets have a really good nutrient and micronutrient profile so if you just look at the numbers here what i've done here is i've arranged the bars according to what each grain is and you can see that as compared to rice in, in uh, carbohydrate content millets at a you know out of 100 will have 67 grams of carbohydrate will have a very high amount of iron which is a micronutrient will have a similar amount of protein as wheat as atta and will have a decent amount of fibers uh, you know compared with comparing itself with corn and so millets actually are low in carbs high in fiber protein and micronutrients and as a bonus they are gluten free and i say that the last because the last thing we should do is eat them because they are gluten free uh, everybody should eat millets if you are gluten intolerant please eat millets even if you are not please eat millets okay because it's always featured as this you know gluten free is this health food and this and that none of that is true everybody should be eating millets and that's why i don't give it much importance except that it's very important for people who are gluten intolerant to have access to millet uh, to gluten free food and millets are gluten free foods okay so um the last point that i want to put forth to you for why this spotlight on millets is important is the drought tolerant climate smart angle of millets and this is featured in multiple interesting um uh, articles and uh, you know overviews and i'm happy to share this these are all interesting uh, millets for next generation climate smart agriculture how here is how millets can make india's food basket climate resilient etc very nice articles that talk in better detail than i can at this point about why they are drought tolerant and how they are going to be able to contribute to our um, our drive to be resilient in the face of climate change all right so this is a summary of everything that i have told you uh, millets are naturally diverse c4 cereal crops uh, there are nine varieties of millets cultivated in india when i say that i mean proso kodo uh, var, um, uh, foxtail nachni etc each of these millets have a 1000 or 2000 land races that they uh, come with which means that when you grow a nachni seed in maharashtra versus you grow it in himachal pradesh the finger millet is going to look different okay here it's going to look maroon there it's going to look uh, orange okay and these are called land races which indicate that they have different nutrients in them because of so many different changes that happen because of the soil the altitude the water that they receive etc um nine varieties are cultivated thousands of land races that are available in the world 
uh, they are nutritionally, uh, you know, I think a great nutrition profile. They're gluten free, drought tolerant, more reliable than most grains on poor soils. They used to be staple food in many parts of the world and we need to revive that. Uh, they have a very short crop cycle, about 100 days. And they can be grown even for your uh, cows and as fodder, okay, for, for animals. So that's where I feel like it hits at least these six boxes of the 17 UN SDPs that were declared um, a couple of years back. And that is why it's important to really think about why not millets. Right? I mean, it is a very compelling uh, sort of uh, reasoning to, or, or a very compelling uh, grain to really think about in the long run. Um, I just want to take five minutes to give you a flavor of the work that I personally did as a postdoctoral researcher on millets. So um, I was a postdoc at the University of California at Berkeley. So this is in the US. And uh, millets are an unknown word there. Okay, the only way people know millets is as bird seed. They are used as fodder for birds. Okay, and uh, they are also known, they are found in the gluten free section of health food departments and are sold at very high prices. So, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do is make millets a more commonly available um, or, or a, common, a common word in people's vocabulary. And uh, that's what we aim to do in these three years through the millet project. So one of the things that we had done, because millets are hardly grown in uh, the US, is we had set up this field at, um, at, a, at a place very close to the university. And I'll just explain to you the experiment, because you know any of these things, uh, why I'm actually showing you this is to illustrate how you can, I mean, you know, this is not necessarily anything to do directly with my research, but I'm setting it up like a research experiment. So you can set up anything like a research experiment in your kitchen, at your home, you should always set up an experiment, okay? And if you set up an experiment, you need to set up controls. And that is part of what I've done here, which I'll briefly walk you through. So you can see that there is one, two, three, four, five rows that we have here, okay? And what we did was, we had uh, these five rows, 200 feet each, and in each row, in the first part, we planted foxtail millet seeds. Second, we planted pearl millet. Third, we planted proso. And fourth, we planted Japanese millet. So each row had all four varieties. Uh, so all five rows had all four varieties, okay, in the same order. Then what we did is we had in row one, we watered that row only two times in 100 days. Uh, at seven days and 14 days, we watered it, okay. Uh, and then the pl plants sprouted by then and that's all. And then we didn't water it after that. So we were trying to simulate drought conditions. Uh, the second row, we watered six times in 38 days. So we let the plants grow a little bit. We watered it for a little bit more time and we stopped. Okay. And then the third, fourth and fifth rows, we watered as much as you would regularly water corn, which is another C4 plant. Okay. So that was our experiment. And the control would be that this has very little water. This has about one third the water that three, four and five are going to receive. What is going to be the outcome? Are these all going to grow similarly? Are they not going to produce any, the ones with little water are not going to grow at all, etc. were our experiments. Also, because we were doing it in one place in California, it's not enough. So what we did was we convinced six other farmers around, in and around our locality to do the same experiment in their fields. Okay. And so six other farmers did exactly this experiment in their fields. And then we had a data set to show how much water was going to be needed. And really are these grains drought tolerant? Really do they grow happily everywhere? Like it's claimed, okay? Uh, so this is that first row that I talk, told you, which has very little growth. This is the second row, which is receiving one third the amount of water as uh, regular plants are, okay? Like uh, as corn, corn is receiving. And what we saw was the height of this, and I don't know, oh no, I don't have another picture, but I had another picture where I could show you all three rows, and the second row, and the third, fourth, fifth row, which had received full watering, looked identical. There was no difference between them, okay? So it tells you that, at least as compared to corn, millets can do with about one third the water under the conditions that we were working with, and the replicates in other farms showed us similar results, all right? So uh, this is just results for Japanese millet. 
the droughted uh, the plant lengths used to change based on the droughted versus reduced versus full watering but the um, year weight which is the millet the 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 fruit that you got which is important for us as food uh, the reduced and the full had not much difference between them very often okay so this is one of the things that we haven't yet published this data but we have some very nice data that is uh, showing this and millets appear to need less water as compared to commonly grown cereals such as rice wheat and corn um, so the learnings from our millet project was that we are really looking for people to learn about the grain when people learn about the grain consumers will cook with millets and that will push the cycle to get farmers to cultivate more millets and i think that's really sort of the goal of what um, the international year of millets is about that people uh, learn more about this you and i are able to cook more with millets applying a pressure to the overall system to be able to cultivate more millets and drive up those numbers which we are seeing are abysmally low overall the next few slides are actually just about um you know uh, how sometimes you know people will ask me how do you eat millets because we are so used to eating the same rice and wheat we know only how to do that uh, how do you eat millets these are some of the varieties in ways in which i consume millets uh, bhakris dosas which is also adding fermented foods to your diet uh this sort of a porridge or a mudda a ragi mudde porridges uh, upmas etc these are all ways in which one can easily consume millets and of course there are lots of these things available today in the market there's beer there's millet malt biscuits etc bread which uh i think are uh, you know i highly encourage you to try uh people are developing these so that it suits uh, the taste of consumers and it's worth it it's it's good to have this variety in your diet um this is the last slide that i actually want to leave you all with and which is addresses the question but then why are millets less popular yet as compared to wheat and rice and my hypothesis is that mass scale production and industrial scale processing makes wheat and rice cheaper it's just easier to produce and store and sell rice and wheat uh maida and rice have long shelf life and that's a huge advantage over millets and wheat and rice are actually very versatile as products because wheat has gluten it really can make a lot of very interesting food breads all sorts of things chapati it will nicely puff up right it's very difficult to unless you are not an expert it's very difficult to puff up a bhakri whereas uh, you know wheat is it's easy to puff the 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 roti and uh, you know i feel like this is the thing and just uh, perspectives from friends who have been working with millets in the last few years um my friend smita who's uh, runs a very good bakery says that the gluten network that wheat is capable of producing simply when combined with water makes the bread light with a clean flavor so she doesn't get that with millets use millets in combination with wheat flour so you get the best of both worlds so those are ways in which i think we can really practically start to combine um you know what we have with introducing millets into our uh, diet um my a friend who's a, a brewer with the great state ale works which is a very nice brewery based in pune says unavailability of millet malt makes it necessary to use unmalted grains for brewing so he says if there's malted millet i'll make beer out of millet and then he's trying to even without getting malted millets is actually working on this uh, millet beer project currently uh, so yeah i would like to end with that and just to thank you to all the people who have supported me so far the university of california isa pune berkeley food institute for a grant which we received for the millet project uh, an outreach project which also supported me and a grant i'm currently working on called transforming education for sustainable futures in which we are incorporating millet as a part of the education so thanks a lot for your patience and for listening to me uh my personal experience is that you know uh, you mentioned bhakri 
So I personally found whether it is jawar bhakri or bajra bhakri, I didn't find it very tasty as compared to say roti or a naan uh, or a paratha, which is much more tasty. So that could be one reason. I mean, if I was given a choice, I would always go for the, <laughs> so I would avoid the bhakri. Uh, so I agree. Yeah. yeah, so that could be one reason why it is not very popular. What do you think? Yes, yes, no, absolutely true. But uh, see. That's why I I come exactly from that school of thought because you know what I can't make my fresh bhakris right. If you actually have a fresh bhakri, it gives anything a run for its money. Like naan and all, exact you you'd love it, but it has to be a fresh bhakri of the tawa, right? Uh, but most of us don't have that luxury, uh, or can't I mean can't make it ourselves. These are other ways like the millet dosa that I can assure you it's essentially you just replace the rice with millet in a dosa recipe. And it makes, I mean, it makes some of the tastiest dosas. And I have some friends in this room who've yes, had even I tasted also tried this. that. <laughs> You've tried this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's identical, or if not more tastier than regular dosa, because it has a flavor of its own. So you can have it with dahi. You don't need any other chutney or other thing. So there are other things which it is, um, it's good at. Like uh, you know, millet puffs, for example, jawar puffs are excellent, like popcorn, right? I mean, it's exactly like popcorn. And those are, I would say, ways in which, because I agree with you, it's a bhakri, a cold bhakri, I don't eat. And I don't think it's amenable to that um, form of eating in our in, in our life today. Uh, but there, there are other ways of intentionally incorporating millets in one's diet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something, right? Yes, yes, exactly, a thali <laughs> or something. Even then, it has to be hot. Yes. Yes. It is otherwise very difficult to achieve. So the ragi uh, based dosa, it becomes very crispy and then. Yeah, because of the additional fiber and stuff, it does make up for a crispier dosa. So exactly, I agree. I mean, I prefer that over rice dosas today. But I don't prefer bhakri over a uh, cold bhakri over a cold chapati. That I can say. These are the few roles of guinea pig that I practice. <laughs> she is one of my guinea pigs, so she she is speaking from that <laughs> angle at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, so I yes. think so. Uh, I think there's one other. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Yes. I just have a doubt uh, yeah. regarding your millet project, not doubt really. Yeah. Just wanted to find out uh, the temperate condition is important, like Rajasthan all very hot and then the millets are grown there. Correct. But in your case, all the experimentation was done in California and around. Correct. Correct. Did you explore uh, places like Arizona or Death Valley where conditions were similar to what we see in Rajasthan? Yeah, so uh, see physically it was very difficult for us to do that because I was located in Berkeley. Uh, but if you look at the millet producing, even US grows millets. The millet producing places are indeed the hot places in, in the US. And they are actually having very good production because they are putting fertile land to use. So there, it's just that millet is not popular as popular as in India. Hence, it doesn't show up on the charts of production. But US actually has a very good okay. millet production uh, happening per hectare. That's what I would say. If you looked at that, their numbers are very good. Okay. And it is, you are absolutely right, in the hot areas, like Nevada right. has excellent millet production in the hot months. Cold months, they don't have anything. Correct. Hot months, they have very good millet production. Then I think uh, Nebraska, those are the two places that have the highest, Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, which have the highest production of millet and their per hectare is higher than Indian fields. That is also there. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Madam, this yeah. is the question regarding diabetic diabetic patients. Yes. Uh, generally, the rice and wheat, these both uh, food grains, they are generally uh, reduced. And instead of that, other like jari, bajri, and ragi. Uh, what is your opinion regarding this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll tell you why it is recommended, and the word that you'll hear for this is this world called glycemic index, right? Low yes, glycemic GI. index is what the doctor will tell you. Eat food with low glycemic index. All that means is that the food that you eat should be releasing glucose into your blood slowly. That is what it means, low glycemic index, okay? Now, why is that true for millets? 
So there's a very logical reason and that's why, but uh, that's what I think it's, huh, it, this is the reason for it. That yeah, because, it, huh, because it is integrated yeah. for your body to be able to remove the starch from the protein and the fiber, it's going to take your enzymes some time. And so the starch that you're eating in the form of millets is very slowly releasing into your bloodstream. The glucose is very, the carbohydrates are very slowly releasing into your bloodstream and hence it is a low glycemic index food. If you eat wheat, actually there is no problem, but you know how industrial wheat is made? So what you do is, you first strip any all wheat that is made in industry today is made, made this way. You first strip the inside from the outside. You make the outside separate, you make the inside separate. You make as much maida you want and then you mix back the maida and the outside. So you mix it back, right? It's not like, that is why when you buy atta, which is like say Pillsbury atta or something, right? They're going, they're going to make it by this technique that I'm telling you. They're first going to separate the starchy endosperm and the outside. Then they mix back the right proportion to give you what is whole grain atta. But mm. actual whole grain atta is you take the grain and you put it into the, uh, yeah, uh, what is it called, the mill and you get your whole grain atta. And that time you don't have a way to separate the starch from the outside from everything else, right? So when you, when you mill your own grain, you get a more wholesome whole grain flour. That also I can tell you. Okay, these are just, you know, you look up how atta is made, YouTube will show you how Pillsbury or somebody makes it. And these are just ways in which you can simplify your industrial process. You're going to make the maida, you're going to make a combination of these two and you're going to sell two different products to the consumer, okay? But when you mill your own grain, you're just making a mixture of all of this. So actually, there are atas, even wheat atas, which are okay for diabetic people. But, you know, milling your own grain is often a great idea. For millets, you have no choice. You can't separate the outside and the inside. So you have to mill it together. And that is why it has a low glycemic index. There's no other, uh, and, and that's what I mean, I don't, what, I mean, I, I, I'm just careful about saying that it is, you know, it'll cure diabetes or something, no. All it does is, it has a low, fact is it has a low glycemic index. So it releases sugar slowly into your bloodstream or carbohydrates, which is good for somebody who has diabetes and has the inability to process sugar quickly. So that is the link between why a doctor is recommending millets to you. Yeah, doctor generally advise correct. To reduce the carb. Reduce the at carb. Least by 50 percent. Correct, correct, correct. And uh, increase the protein food yes. so that you can get the relief. And fiber, fiber. They yeah, tell fiber. You. Yeah, and that is this this chart tells you that. Thank you, madam. This chart tells you that. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ashok ji. So with this. Uh, today is a kind of the end of the physical over here uh, event of the National Science Day celebration and thank you for coming over here and participating in these uh, various events. Thank you very much. <laughs>